As we begin our worship this morning, you are invited at this time to light a candle. Let us pray together. We light this candle as a symbol of our trust in Jesus Christ, that our sins are forgiven when we repent and turn back to God. Amen. Good morning, church, and welcome to the worship of God here at our virtual gathering of Danville Congregational Church. We are so glad that you're able to join us here this morning for worship. We are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. We're a people of extravagant welcome. No matter what you look like, talk like, sing like, move like, vote like, or love like, you are welcome here. And indeed, we're glad that you're here with us today. If you're new to our community, we invite you to say hi in the chat box and to introduce yourself and share whatever information that you would like us to have, and a member of our community will welcome you here this morning. Uh, we have a couple announcements that we want to get started with today. As always, you're invited to um, download the bulletin for the morning by going to danvillechurch.org slash bulletins. Uh, in the bulletin, you will find worship notes uh, for Black History Month, along with an anti-racism calendar and resources uh, that we have been following throughout this month of Black history. Our good news is out and was published this week. Uh, it was distributed via email and some hard copies were mailed out to those on our um, snail mail distribution list. And so uh, we hope that you've had the opportunity to read your good news and to check it out. If not, it's available on the church website. If you have a joy or concern that comes up for you in the middle of the week that you will, would like us to be in prayer for on Sunday morning, we invite you to submit your prayer requests ahead of time to me at eric at danvillechurch.org. There will be a second hour coffee chat today at 11 a.m. Uh, hosted by our anti-racism team. Uh, the youth group will be meeting tonight at five o'clock. Check your email for those details. 
Uh, and as always, you're invited to join me on Thursday mornings at 9 a.m. for just a casual time of coffee and conversation and checking in. Uh, you can come for five minutes or stay for the whole hour. Pastor Todd's going to talk a little bit about our spiritual practice for this week. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, in the Lent in a bag that most of you should have received by now were a variety or are a variety of spiritual practices to help us deepen our experience of this Lenten season. The spiritual practice for this week uh, is the bag of sand that was in, uh, that was in your bag. You don't have to do these in order, but maybe the knowledge that all of us will be in the wilderness uh, engaged in that practice throughout this week may be an encouragement to you. If you did not get a bag, um, a, a Lent bag, please reach out to the church office so we can make sure that we get that to you. Thanks. Thanks, Pastor Todd. Beginning on Sunday, March 21st, we will have our first installment of a new anti-racism learning series hosted by our anti-racism team at DCC. Uh, this series will begin at 11 o'clock and go till 1230. And this first gathering uh, that is uh, being facilitated by our team will uh, just be a time for orientation and then a co-creation of the curriculum that uh, the group hopes to follow. Um, so there is information in the bulletin about this learning series, and we hope many of you will uh, join in uh, on the learning and the unlearning. Uh, throughout the Lenten season, we will be receiving a special offering for Black homeownership reparations. Uh, there's information in the bulletin uh, about this ongoing offering, and later in the service today, we will have a mission moment from our friends from Arlington Community Church, the sponsoring congregation of this offering that many uh, Bay Area UCC churches are participating in. Uh, so we hope that you'll keep your ears open uh, during that time uh, of mission uh, moment. Friends, uh, those are the announcements that I have here for you this morning. Uh, it is good to see so many of your faces on the screen today. Uh, let's prepare our hearts in our minds now as we are led in our call to worship by Piper. Please join me in the call to worship. To you, O oh God, I lift up my soul. We lift up our souls to you. O oh my God, I, in you I trust. We, we trust. trust in God, the creator of all. We wait for you, God of deliverance. Teach us your paths and lead us to truth. Remember not our transgressions. Show us mercy and your steadfast love. You are good and upright, Holy One. Lead us and instruct us in all your ways. We long to remain in covenant with you, O God. Keep us on your path of steadfast love and faithfulness. Peace be with you and also with you. Let us greet one another with waves and smiles and pass the peace of Christ using the chat feature.
Beloved friends, please join me now in our prayer of confession. Oh God, we have ignored you too long. Where there is privilege, we have become complacent. Where there is silence, we have become complicit. Where there is ignorance, we have become comfortable. Disturb us, O oh God, unsettle us. Inspire within us repentance. To, to accept our part in injustice, to be courageous in changing our own hearts, and to be wise to the ways we are distracted from your and our faith. Amen. We've come to that point in our service together where we especially want to invite the attention of our youngest members among us. I just want to look through the Zoom and see who I see. First of all, you're all young and young at heart, but I am looking for, let's see, there's Hazel. And uh, did I see Zane earlier? Let's see, where is their little window? There's Aria. Good morning. Who else? Am I missing anyone? There may be some folks. There's Max. Good morning. Who else do we have? Well, if I didn't call your name, it's just because I didn't see you and I ask for you to forgive me. So this morning, I'm going to ask the Zoom to see if there's anyone in here who might have at some point in their life made a mistake. Oh, hey, Oliver, I see you there too. Has anybody ever made a mistake or maybe done something wrong and hurt someone else's feelings or maybe didn't do something that you were supposed to? Yeah, yeah, a whole lot of us, me too. So this morning we're going to talk about another one of those words uh, that sometimes is a little difficult and maybe even might feel a little uncomfortable, and that word is repentance. The root word there, repent, the act of repenting, repentance. And so I'm going, because this is such a difficult word, I'm going to invite our friend. You know, you knew Marty was going to come. Everyone say good morning to Marty. Looky there. Look at everybody. Yep. Yep. You see Zane over there? Mm-hmm. Good. So good to see uh, everyone this morning, isn't it, Marty? Mm-hmm. So I thought we would talk about ways that we could practice repentance. Marty, would you help me do that this morning? Yeah? Okay. So I've got these little signs that I found at a store, and I want you to, to write these down as I go, okay? And here's a piece of chalk. All right, ready? Okay, so the first part of repentance, it's kind of hard to do, is saying sorry. And we want to talk about repentance in the context of being more than just saying sorry. Pastor Eric shared with me this week that repentance is a choice to think differently and live differently. But we want to start that process with simply saying we're sorry. Okay. All right. So the second one, the second thing is... All right, here we go, is asking forgiveness. So we would say that we're sorry, and then we would ask the person for their forgiveness, okay? All right, that's two, pretty, pretty good so far. So the next one is we want, after we say we're sorry, and after we ask for forgiveness, we want to try to make it right. See that? Oops, there went the candle. Sorry about that. Okay, we wanna to try to make it right. And then after that, we'll talk about how to do that in a second. After that, we ask for forgiveness. We say we're sorry, we ask for forgiveness. Try to do better. Okay, so let's see, Marty, would you help me um, practice this out and let's see if we can do this together. Okay, so. Oh, so it hurts your feelings that 
you said you wanted the last banana and I took it from you and ran away into the other room and that hurt your feelings? Ugh, fine, I'm sorry. How do we think I did with that? Mm, not so good, yeah. Okay, so let's, let's try that a different way. Marty, I'm, I'm sorry that I took the last banana when you said you wanted it and you called it first and then I ran in the other room and ate it really fast. I'm really sorry. Can you forgive me for doing that? Oh, thank you. And, um, you know, I want to I wanna try to make it up to you. I went to the store this morning and look what I found. Would you like this banana? And I promise that going forward, I'm going to try to do my very best to think about others instead of myself sometimes. And so maybe if there's only one pre piece of fruit left, instead of taking it, I'm going to try to think about mm, maybe I can share that or maybe give it to someone else. So how does that feel? Yeah, you got a banana out of it. So I hope it feels really good. So yeah, that is, that is sort of repentance. It's a choice where we think and live differently, saying we're sorry, asking for forgiveness, making it right, and trying, even if we won't get it right every time, trying to do better each time. So Marty, thanks for helping me tell this lesson about repentance. And let's pray together uh, before we move into our scripture lesson. And you can pray along with me. Dear God, thank you for this day, for the sunshine and the blue skies. God, help us to do better and better each day and to seek out forgiveness when we make mistakes. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. There we go. <clears throat> this morning, our scripture lesson continues in the gospel of Jesus according to Mark, uh, chapter, chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. <clears throat> Hear these words. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. <clears throat> And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. <clears throat> and a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Our modern lesson today is from the Reverend William Barber II. Hear these words. While we not, must name and resist white supremacy, we can also recall that we are never alone in this work. During the 19th century, there were anti-racist abolitionists, black and white, who worked to subvert and transform a system that considered some people should tell. In the new dawn of reconstruction, black and white men worked together in state houses across the South to reimagine democracy. 
During the 20th century's movement for labor unions, women's suffrage and human, civil and environmental rights, fusion coalitions of black, white, brown, native and Asian work together to pursue a more perfect union that both acknowledges our original sin and holds onto the hope that we might yet live up to the better angels of our nature. Whenever we ask what repentance means, we don't have to start from scratch. We look at a long tradition to draw on, full of examples of what true repentance must look like. May God bless our hearing and response to these ancient and modern words, amen. Friends, will you join me in a moment of prayer? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on each one of us. And may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts together be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, for you are our strength, our guide, and our redeemer. Amen. One sentence has remained with, with me throughout most of 2020 and now as we're in the year 2021. And I am reminded of this sentence as we begin our Lenten season and this Lenten series. The sentence is short. It's just three words. And yet in it, we hear the suffering that is wrought by white supremacy. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. These words have reverberated across the airways throughout this past year and have become all too familiar. We hear them spoken on the evening newscast. We read them as the latest headline. Now, I don't know how else to begin this sermon and thus this series without these three words. I can't breathe. These words have haunted me this last year. I imagine that they have haunted you too. I don't know and I will never know what it's like to have the knee of a police officer against my neck, but I still can't breathe. The last year has left so many in our country filled with anger, grief and despair and I am one of them. I feel powerless and afraid I don't know who to trust. I don't know what to believe. I have been overwhelmed by the suffering and pain of our black and brown siblings. I'm heartbroken over our self-centered politics. And I am painfully aware of my white male privilege. I cry every time I see the video or pictures of another unarmed black person killed by violent police. But I have also cried when I saw a video of police officers kneeling before protesters. And another one of those police officers and protesters dancing in the streets. I've never thought of myself as a protester, but this past year I have been activated. Activated to learn and unlearn, to do and to undo. And if I'm being honest, I approach all of this with trepidation. It's not easy work, it's uncomfortable work, but it's required of us. That's why I can't breathe. Those are the things that have stolen my breath this past year. What about you? What has stolen your breath this past year? 
What has the last year been like for you? What has all of this brought up in you? I want to be able to breathe again. I want others to be able to breathe. I want the George Floyds and the Breonna Taylors and the Trayvon Martins of the world to be able to breathe. I want us to breathe faith and hope and love. I want us to breathe repentance, forgiveness, and healing. I want us to breathe justice, compassion, and peace. Don't you? Don't you want to breathe those things too? Don't you want those things for yourself, for your kids and your grandchildren, for the people of our country, and for the world? You know, that's what Jesus is talking about over and over and over again throughout the Gospels and in the Great Commission when he says, go therefore and make disciples. Those are the qualities we are to teach and into which we are to immerse and baptize the people of the world. And that discipling, that teaching and immersing has to begin with our own lives within the deep places of our hearts. So let's not back off or turn away from what has happened or what is going on right now within us. A life of God is calling you and me, our country and our world to something new, to think differently, to live differently. I have been entranced this week by our gospel reading. One of Jesus's first recorded spoken words is a word that means think differently. The word is repent. Now you might be surprised to hear that. Most of us carry our own assumptions and baggage with the word repent. It lands on most of us as a harsh word, a hard word, a command to feel bad or ashamed of our moral failings. It seems to always come with an exclamation point and a threat, repent or else. But the word for repent in Greek actually means change your way of thinking. It's about seeing things in a new way. It's about discovery and recognizing things in a way we had not before. To put it simply, to repent is to think differently. The reading from Mark this morning contains Jesus's first words in the gospel. In this inaugural sermon following his time in the wilderness, Jesus says the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe in the good news. This inaugural sermon follows a period where Jesus went into the wilderness, a time to look inward, to gain clarity, and to discern the call God had for his life. And now not long after that, he returns to Galilee, gives this inaugural sermon, and then goes and calls his first disciples. And it's what happens after this inaugural sermon that I want to focus on for just a moment. Following this moment, with a verbal net, he scoops up those first disciples out of the sea of life, the sea that they have been living in, and he invites them to a new life as his first followers. We know this story well. We hear it told nearly every year, if not multiple times in a year. Now, many of us, understandably, see this text as an example of some sort of personal call story, where God is handing, hand-selecting a particular person or group of people with particular gifts for a particular job. But one scholar that I read this week suggests that this scripture reading is more of it's time. It's an it's time kind of story. 
it's time. It's time to move. It's time to change. It's time to think differently. Professor Matt Skinner writes, when Jesus reemerged from the wilderness and returned to Galilee, he first summoned Simon, Andrew, James, and John, and maybe also when he called Mary Magdalene, Mary, Salome, and others. Those people, they weren't encountering a charismatic stranger for the first time. It's not that he suddenly broke into their lives, announcing that their number had come up in the great discipleship sweepstakes. They were hearing a familiar preacher and perhaps even a friend telling them that the time has come for a new direction or a new intensity. Jesus was ready and now, now, and they needed to be ready too. It's time, Jesus said. Time to move from preparation to action. Time to stop hoping for change and time to start laboring for it. Time to enlist help in a ministry that was about proclaiming repentance, urging people to adopt a new outlook on their world and their place in it. It's time to think differently. I cannot help but wonder how those early disciples started to think differently that day. Or maybe they were people who were already thought a little bit differently in their world than those around them. I mean, let's be honest, how many of us have or would even start thinking differently, drop everything we are doing to completely upend our life and our way of living? They must be seeing something in a new way, or at least they long for the possibility, the possibility of seeing life in a new way. It's time, Jesus says. It's time to repent, to think differently. And these new followers are ready. And so I wonder what it's time for in your life. In our life collectively, it's time to be honest about the places where white supremacy resides, whether it resides in the deep places of our hearts or in the systems and structures that benefit us. We don't have to start from scratch though. The Reverend William Barber II encourages us not to. We have a long tradition to draw on, full of examples of true repentance, of people thinking differently and thus living differently. Barber writes, during the 19th century, there were anti-racist abolitionists, black and white, who worked to subvert and transform a system that considered some people to tell. In the new dawn of reconstruction, black and white men worked together in state houses across the South to imagine democracy. During the 20th century's movements for labor unions, women's suffrage and civil, human and environmental rights, fusion coalitions of black, white, brown, native and Asian worked together to pursue a more perfect union that both acknowledges our original sin and hold on to the hope that we might yet live up to the better angels of our nature. We must repent if we not only want to hope for, but labor for a better and more just world. Jesus demands it. To see that there is more that unites us than divides us is to think differently. To love our enemies is to think differently. To forgive that which the world believes is unforgivable is to think differently. To give away your wealth is to think differently. To believe we are not what we do or what we've done or what's been done to you is to think differently. To know that the currency of the world is mercy and love not money and power, is to think differently. To trust that those who think differently than you are not outside the circle, 
of God's grace is to think differently. To see those on the margins of life as those at the center of God's heart is to think differently. My friends, Lent is a much deeper season than simply giving up something. It's a season that leads us to new life through death. New life, rebirth, through hearing and claiming words that you belong to God and you are God's beloved. Words which can then lead to the death of those destructive voices within our lives. And dying to the destructive trappings and sin of white supremacy, I wonder what new life is being born? What new life is being born in you and in us? I wonder where is God wanting you to think and to live differently? You will have to answer those questions yourself. And in answering them, may they cause you to repent. You can do this. You can do this. We can do this. Because the heavens have been torn open, never to be closed again. And the spirit of God, that spirit of God is descending upon you. It has entered into you. May it be so. Amen.
Beloveds, let us continue this prayer together. You are invited to submit your joy or concern in the chat box so that we can hold those together during our time of prayer. And know that if words are too difficult or impossible to find, know that the Spirit of our God hears your prayer too. Let's continue this time of prayer with a moment of silence. Holy God, we dwell in your presence and ask for you to have mercy upon us. We know that you hear the prayers of your people. We believe that the things that we say aloud and the things that we keep in the silence of our heart are known and held by you. So we come before you with those silences, and also with these expressions from members of our community. Chris Evans invites prayers for his for friend Rhonda, who is suffering from depression. God, in your mercy and your healing, hear our prayer. Prayers from Joyce Clausen. Please pray for the family of my brother, Niall Power, who died on Friday in Sydney, Australia. He had lived with cancer for many years and remained strong and positive until just a few days ago. His heart and mind were willing, but his body could not sustain him. Rest in peace. God, in your love and mercy, Hear our prayer. From Gail Clark, I am so very thankful to finally have put the challenge of dealing with kidney stone treatment behind me and for the return of health. Thank you for all of your care and concern for me these past 30 days. God, in your healing and love, hear our prayer. Melissa Tumeneg invites prayers for the Northern California Nevada Conference as it looks to the March 13th special meeting gathering to decide how to proceed with the Camp Casadero property. If you're a voting delegate, please join and exercise your vote for DCC. God, in your mercy and your love, hear our prayer. Pastor Eric invites prayers for their friend Megan who lost her mother, Dorothy, to COVID-19 last week. Prayers of comfort and hope. God, in your healing and your mercy and your love, hear our prayer. And Laura Beaver invites us to join prayers of thanksgiving for Oliver as he turns 11 tomorrow. What a blessing he is. <laughs> God, in your great joy and love, hear our prayer. And Kurt Sauer invites prayers for his sister Lisa and her husband Barry. Lisa's cancer has become unchecked again, and we're hoping that new treatment will extend her time with us. God, God, in your mercy and your healing, hear our prayer. Carol invites prayers for Marilyn and her family and friends as she passed away yesterday. God, in your hope and your mercy, hear our prayers. Holy God, have mercy. Christ, 
sibling of us all, have mercy. We come before you as a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquities. We repent, O oh God, for the 500-year oppression of Black people and other people of color. We repent of the smug self-satisfaction with our material prosperity, prosperity rooted in exploitation. We repent of our church steeped in the cultural values of consumerism, comfort, and white supremacy. We repent of tithing mint and dill and cumin while neglecting justice and mercy and faith. We have indeed strained out a gnat and swallowed a camel. We repent of our deliberate ignorance about race and racism, the practiced innocence and convenient naivete that protect us from acknowledging the truth. We repent of the myths we tell, the lies we defend, the unlearned, unearned, deserved, undeserved privileges we like to call blessings. We repent of the institutions we have built, the systems and structures, the policies and practices that created and perpetuate white supremacy. We repent of blaming the oppressed for their oppression, masking our hate with pity and contempt. We repent of our self-serving complacency, our pretense that time equals progress, our insistence that we are one of the good guys. Holy parent, forgive us for we know exactly what we do. Now, O oh breath of God, breathe within us change that we may think differently, that we may live differently. And in this act of repentance, inspire us to make things right and to move individually and as a community of faith into doing better, into being better, into transforming the world around us just as our sibling Jesus modeled for us, for it is time. Breath of God, breathe within us your love, your justice, your hope, and let our lives be an exhalation of love, justice, and of hope. God of mercy, hear our prayer as we pray together the words that our sibling Jesus taught us. Our loving God, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greetings. My name is Reverend Nate Klug, and I'm here with two other members of Arlington Community Church, Susan Russell and Reverend Barry Kammer. Hello. Hi, Hi Barry. Nate. And we're so excited to think that there are other churches and organizations and individuals who might be joining with us this season of Lent to collect an offering to benefit the Black Homeownership Reparations Fund. And we thought it would be helpful to take just a minute to explain where this idea for the Black Home Ownership Reparations Fund uh, came about, how it arose in our congregation, and then to just talk a, a little bit in specifics about what the fund intends to do. So Susan, you're gonna start us off. Yes, thank you. Um, the, the idea for the fund grew out of a racist anonymous group, which began meeting last summer to discuss how we can actively become anti-racist at Arlington Community Church. I know many churches have groups like this um, in the wake of the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor murders and the explosion of new books on the subject filling up the bestseller list. 
During one meeting, I brought up the idea of reparations. It's something I've been thinking about since reading ta Coates' wonderful essay in The Atlantic on the subject in 2014, where I first learned of all the specific historic barriers to black wealth creation, chief among them barriers to home ownership. Barry heard the word reparations and it sparked something in him as well. So we began a conversation after a few months of talking and research, we settled on the idea of supporting black home ownership as a way to help repair a small part of the financial damage of racism and white supremacist policies. In particular, the longstanding barriers to black home ownership that have existed in our East Bay communities. Barry and I have committed a portion of our assets to establish the fund at the Richmond Community Foundation. He'll tell you more about it. Thanks, Susan. The biggest barrier for black wealth in our country is an inability to buy a home. And while many families and individuals have the income to buy a house and get a mortgage, it is difficult to come up with the amount of money for a down payment because there hasn't been wealth passed down over generations. And so our goal is to help black families and individuals to buy a home by offering them assistance with down payment in the form of a 0% interest uh, loan that's only repaid upon sale or refinance of the house. This is a way we hope to really make, uh, make a difference in really healing the inequities of racism in our country, where we know that 77% of white families own homes and only 44% of black families own homes. This is our way of taking our privilege, our abilities and giving it back to the community. Nate. Thanks so much, you guys. If you have more specific questions about how this fund works, I direct you to the information page on our website. We'll put the link right on the screen below. Earlier this week, we just received news that if our group of local churches is able to raise $10,000 during Lent, our offering will be matched in its entirety by the Berkeley Pilgrimage Foundation. So we thank you for giving as generously as you are able to this season. Let's join together in a moment of prayer. Holy God, be with us as we consider giving something of ourselves to this fund over the coming weeks. In this Lenten season of self-examination, God, open our hearts to considering the damage that white supremacist housing policies have done and continue to do and how we may have benefited from them. Help us to look injustice squarely in the face so that we may work for justice. And in this season of renewal, God, grant us glimpses of the different kind of society we are called to help build along with you. In a small way, may our giving contribute to this work of repair. In a small way, may our giving offer someone hope. In a small way, may our giving heal us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All the paths of God are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep God's covenant and decrees. Our church's ministries are extensions of God's love and faithfulness made possible through the generous giving of our time, energy, and money. With love, let us offer our gifts to God. If you choose, you can donate uh, online by going to our website, www.danvillechurch.org, and clicking the Donate button on the upper right of the screen.
Let us pray. Faithful God, let these gifts be like food and drink in the wilderness for those who have suffered and longed for your presence. May these offerings strengthen those who are resisting temptation and lead us to attend to all who need your healing touch. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our example and Savior. Amen. Amen. Beloved friends, as we journey on the way of suffering toward the cross, we do so knowing that we are not alone. We journey with one another, and within that great cloud of witnesses, our forebears in the faith. God of light and dust, be with you, and also with you. Open wide our hearts. We open them up to God. Let us give thanks to God, our creator. Even in the midst of suffering, we give God our praise. Here and now, we give thanks for the steadfast love of God that we see reflected in Jesus. We are grateful for one another and for all the saints who have come to the table throughout history and to those who will gather here after we have returned to the dust. This morning, we remember that Jesus continued on his journey. And as he continued, he could see that his time was drawing near. Our Christ knew that his revolutionary love would take him to the cross and to deep suffering. And as the final night was upon him, he drew close to his friends to embrace the love he had with them. He shared one last table. Jesus embraced the bread in his weathered hands. He broke it and he gave it to his friends, asking them to remember him. Jesus clasped the cup containing the fruit of the vine. He gave thanks one last time, and he asked them to remember them, remember him. The bread of life, the cup of the new covenant, both given to us, and so it is, beloved friends, that we bring our brokenness and in the sharing are made whole. We bring our lives and in the pouring out enter into solidarity along the way of suffering. Take and eat and drink food for our journey. Let us pray together. We give our God thanks and gratitude for this meal that we and that we have come together as one body of Christ in these next 40 days. And as we travel the road to the crucifixion, continue to keep us awake to the ways we can respond to the suffering of the world around us. Amen.
Beloved in Christ, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is near. It is now. Repent. Think differently. Live differently. Believing in this good news. And go into the world as ambassadors of hope, love, and the justice of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. As we extinguish this light, we acknowledge the darkness and pain of injustice in the world. Let us pray together. As we journey through this holy season of Lent, give us strength and courage to make the changes that are needed in our lives. Open our hearts and minds to your steadfast presence and help us to put our trust in you. Amen. concludes our worship for this first Sunday in Lent. We are so glad that you were able to be here with us. Uh, we will be gathering again, at the same time, same place next week. So we hope you can join us for that. In a moment, we are going to transition to our breakout rooms and you all will be, have the ability to unmute yourselves. <laughs> 